so uh, I love ridiculous things. We're going to do a bunch of ridiculous things today. I'm going to do some ridiculous things. You're going to do some ridiculous things. It's going to be fun. It's going to be wonderful. Today is a really magnificent day for me because today my book was released on Amazon, which I have been waiting for, I might say. I'm super thrilled. It doesn't really fit unless I do it this way, and then you guys all have to like read it that way, which is unfortunate. But um, because it came out a little later, I only have three proof copies. A proof copy says proof in the back, which I'd like to say makes a collector's item. <laughs> Yes. So um, I will be, I don't know what they're going to do with the book signing. Maybe I'll just sit there and give advice, um, <laughs> which is fine with me. But um, I will give these proof copies away because I'm going to ask for volunteers. And there'll be 15 volunteers, which means uh, one of five will be able to get, actually, there's only 13 volunteers. But still, you, volunteering will get you a book, potentially. But we all know that irregular reward schedules are more effective than regular ones. OK. <laughs> so sorry, game designer. Um, so this is a really important talk to me. It's a personal journey, because I actually don't know if you know this about me, but I was studying creative writing in a master's program many years ago. And um, we would like sit around and drink wine and talk about voice and style. And it was all very deep. And I was working on a novel. I had to finish a novel to get my MFA. I still do not have an MFA to this day. Um, and it turns out that um, I was writing this book, and I was literally boring myself. Like, it had, like, I was talking about these 20 uh, something slackers who hung out all day and, I don't know, drank wine and talked about Proust. Who knows? Um, and so when I sat down to write this book, um, I really love the books of Patrick Lencioni. I don't know if you know these, Five Dysfunctions of a Team or Death by Meeting, but I love these books because they had a story, and I could learn about everything through a story. And I was like, OK, it's time to go back. It's time to learn how to tell a story so that people will learn the things I want them to learn. And so um, being the kind of person I am, uh, I read a lot of books. I read all of these books. And these are the, just the ones I found in my Kindle by doing a search on story. Um, and then I found all these books as well. Um, I've read so many books. And there is um, patterns that come out. You're reading these books and you're starting to go, oh, wait, you know, this one's got some hero's journey stuff, and this one's got uh, Freytag's triangle, and this has got the seven point, plot point system. Like, I can take you through all these if you're, if you're that interested. Um, but there were really strong patterns, and I started to get excited about these patterns. I thought, you know, if there's patterns, they might mean something. And then I came across this guy's work. His name is Kendall Haven. And Kendall Haven is like a lucky guy, because he started out as a physicist, and then he became a professional storyteller, like in the natural career path of these things. <laughs> and um, he hung out with a bunch of other professional storytellers, because I guess they have a club or something. And, um, they're like, hey, Kendall, we know that this architecture works for making powerful stories. But we don't know why it works. So since you're kind of science-y, would you go, like, go get a grant or something and, and figure out why these stories work so well? And he went out and he uh, got a DARPA grant. You know, and he was able to you know, tell people stories. And while he was telling them these stories, you know, he would, um, you know, have the blood pressure machine on, and he'd be like taking a, a dopamine swabs and taking blood, and they had MRIs on them, you know, all the time while he's, you know, telling these wonderful stories, right? So he found out something really interesting, which is my overlap of all these classical stories and the science of what makes architecture work were essentially the same thing. And you know, um, I don't like the word or, I like the word and. So I like qualitative and quantitative. I like to put it all together, right? It's kind of exciting. And so what happened is um, we humans, we actually learned to read and write um, about 7,000 years ago. One more zero, okay? 
but we've been doing storytelling One hundred and fifty thousand years. In fact, they keep put finding signs that we've been telling stories even longer than that. So why is that? Why are those interesting numbers? Those are interesting numbers because we've been telling stories long enough for evolution to happen. Our brains have literally changed to pay attention to stories. So when we tell a story, right, and you're getting all excited, you're like and this happened, and this happened, and this happened, and there were some of these things that happened, and uh, one of those, right? And all this goes to your listener, and your listener actually puts it through a filter. Kendall calls it the neuro story net. And everything that fits into the story pattern, into the architecture, they keep. They'll hang on to that. Unfortunately, anything that doesn't fit into the story architecture gets forgotten and is lost. So, but there's a cure for this, which is really interesting. If this person is smart enough to tell the story based on a story arc, it actually goes through that neural story net and is kept intact in this person's brain. So they found out that if they actually took facts and took data and put it into the story architecture, it changed people profoundly. They had higher attention, they had higher comprehension, and they had higher retention. And I'm a teacher, and so this is really important to me. I teach all the time to students. And believe me, attention is a struggle. Retention is incredibly difficult. And comprehension is a goddamn miracle. <laughs> so I was very excited by this idea. Story, OK. And um, you know, story is going to beat facts most of the time, unfortunately. I hate verses, but it is a fact. So Kendall talked about these eight characteristics. Um, are they on the screen? Good. The eight characteristics, um, which was character, character traits, that's like the personality aspects, the character's goal and their motivation, conflicts and problems, risks and dangers, struggles, and details. Now, um, he has a wonderful video. You all can go watch it. Um, but I took this, and I actually mapped it against what all the writers were talking about, these best-selling writers, uh, you know, E.M. Forrester and uh, Stephen King. Two names I never thought I would put in the same sentence, but here we are. And so um, they figured out that, um, I've, that there were these key things. Sorry, I'm repeating myself a little bit. So let's take a character, right? Let's take Batman. And remember, Kendall says, Batman's got to have a goal and a motivation. So, what's Batman's goal? Hmm? Save Gotham? Fight bad guys? Fight crime? Why does he fight crime? My artist is now throwing things in. Avenge his parents. I love it. Avenge parents. Now, he actually has an internal conflict. Why does he dress like a bat? I mean, OK, you nerds, we know, to strike hearts and the fear of wrongdoers, blah, blah, blah. But um, I think the official story is because he needs to protect loved ones. So he's always going to have a conflict that Bruce Wayne is this goofy playboy, but Batman is this tough, dark, potentially good guy or possibly a bad vigilante. He's very conflicted, and that makes for some fun storytelling. OK. So what's interesting about those points is that um, you see them over and over again. And it almost doesn't matter what the goal is. So let's take Harry Potter, right? He um, is trying to kill an evil sorcerer, Voldemort. And you know we can all relate to that, because who doesn't have an evil sorcerer in their life, right? Um, no, the goal doesn't matter. What matters is the motivation. Here's a kid 
who lost his parents. He's living with people who keep him locked under a cupboard. Why nobody has called the cops on them, I have no idea. But um, he finally gets to a school where he has friends and family, and he wants to protect that new friends and family. So as you craft these stories, you need a goal could be almost anything, but the motivation needs to be the same as your audience. If you create motivations that are the same as the audience, people will be like, this story could be about me. Just like in the olden days when you know, somebody came back and told a story about the time they tried to pet the really big kitty and the really big kitty almost ate them and they were running through the savanna. It's like, oh, you know, I'm in the savanna a lot. I should watch out for those big kitties. As soon as we hear a motivation that's similar to ours, we're going to pay attention because we think our survival is, is part of it. So we've got you know, this character with a goal and a motivation. And you know what? What's interesting about this is we all have goals and motivations. For example, I have a goal, which is to lose some weight. My motivation, I would like to dance at my daughter's wedding. I want to stay healthy. I want to be there for the people who love me. And yet, month after month goes by without really getting on that diet. Isn't that funny how that happens? So what we need is we need an inciting incident. The inciting incident is something that will prompt your character to finally take action. And so this is really interesting for you guys who are product designers, because if you can figure out the inciting incident to get your customers to take action, you actually know where to reach out to them. You know where to market to them. So in my case, the inciting incident might be uh, I get a letter about a relative who dies from diabetes, or maybe I just step on the scale and see a number I've never seen before, and I am alarmed deeply and profoundly. You know. But there's something that happens that changes you. So now we're going off on our big adventure. And what's really critical is we've got to have struggles. We've got to have struggles. Sometimes, actually fairly often in genre fiction, they're called try-fail cycles. OK, try fail cycles. So who here has not seen The Princess Bride? OK, I'm going to ruin the movie for you. Okay. But it's 20 years old, so cool. tough. Yeah, <laughs> You're, you had a chance pretty much your whole life. Um, it's really funny, because when I do this for my students, they're all like, I'm like, oh, your education is being neglected. OK, Princess Bride. So there's a character. Whose favorite character is Inego Montoya? Yeah? Everybody loves Inigo Montoya? You know why we love Inigo Montoya? He is not the main character. But it's because he has the most try-fail cycles of anyone. <laughs> so this poor guy, his dad was a sword maker, for you, and his dad was murdered by a six-fingered man, right? The six-fingered man. His dad's murdered by the six-fingered man, and so he becomes the best swordsman in the world to get revenge upon the six-fingered man. And the first time he meets a dread pirate, Roberts, um, he says, you know, just ask him, but how many figures have you got? He's like, five. So that's his first try and fail cycle. Then, of course, he gets beaten up. He's losing heart. He's afraid he's never going to find the six-fingered man. So what happens? He uh, gets really stinky drunk. Um, he's given up trying. But then his best friend, the giant, says, Hey, I have heard of the six-fingered man. Apparently, he's in the castle. He's excited. He's going to try. However, they can't get in the castle. He fails. Oh, but the dread pirate Roberts probably could get us in the castle. Hooray! But the dread pirate Roberts is dead. Fail. But we can bring him back to life with Miracle Max. Yay! This movie really makes a lot more sense if you're watching it. <laughs> And they bring him back to life, but he's sort of mostly alive, and he's not really functioning quite right, and they can't break into the castle because they're missing something. Fail. But then they find out they have a wheelbarrow, so they can get in. <laughs> really does make more sense in the movie. And finally, he comes across a six-fingered man. And this is like my favorite mo moment in the movie. What happens? He's like, my name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. And the six-fingered man goes, and runs down the hall. He runs away, right? So he chases him down, he chases him down, he chases him down, and finally he capture, gets the six-figure man. They're fighting, they're sword fighting. We're like, finally, we're going to get our moment. And what happens? He gets run through. And this is a horrible, dark moment. In fact, in our arc, it is called the crisis. This is when things cannot get any worse. And Inigo Montoya 
is falling down, blood coming out. He's like, that's it. And our six-fingered man says, how pathetic. You went all these years trying to kill me, and now you're about to fail when you're this close? And what does Inigo do? He reaches deep down into his willpower, and he says, my name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. And he chants it as he pulls himself up with his strength of will and kills the six-fingered man. And that's called a climax. And then, after that, I couldn't even remember what happens. Um, the reason I draw this as a wave is because once we solve the problem, our interest actually drops, just like a wave of the water which collapses once it's reached its highest level. And so here we have a resolution. I believe he becomes the next Red Pirate Roberts and uh, return home changed. This is about the only thing I steal from uh, Campbell. I think it's a really good one though. So he is no longer haunted. He is no longer haunted by revenge. So let me get this a little more centered. Sorry, as I draw it wanders. So this is a really powerful architecture for your story. And if you can shape your stories into this architecture, you will get people's interest because that little lizard brain likes things that come in this shape. So what I'd like to do is I would like to have, I know it's not lucky, 13 volunteers from the audience. And um, if you don't volunteer, I'll just throw things. But remember, you know, come on, 13 volunteers, come on. Yes, come up, just come up, just run up. Just run up, okay, we got one. Stand next to him that way. We're gonna, you're gonna go left. You go left, you stand next to him. You stand next to her. <laughs> go that way, a little more, a little more. Next, next to her. You guys have numbers on this, that should help you figure it out. Yay, 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 yay. This one always gets a big laugh, you want that one. Okay, so you guys now all have in your hands, do we have a mic for Q&A or something? Is there a mic floating around? Otherwise I just have to stand really close to people and that'll be uncomfortable. Okay, here we go. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna unhook. Okay, so, so what we're gonna do is you each have part of the story arc. You have a character. You need to think of your character with their goal and motivation. You have a setting and maybe a situation. You're gonna put us in the world. You have an inciting incident. What makes this person go off on their journey? You have, they try something, they fail. They try something, they fail. They try something, they fail. He knows how this game. Things could not get worse. Oh, you're still on fail. Yeah. Things could not get worse, worst possible thing. But then through willpower, insight, brilliance, things get better. Wrap it all up nicely for us quickly. And then you get to tell us what the moral of the story is. Okay. Is this working? Beautiful. Okay. So have fun. Hand over the mic after you tell us. So I'm Frodo Baggins from Middle Earth. <laughs> and I've got this ring, and it's super evil, and I need to destroy it. I hope there are pirates in the story. OK. My, I, I can make up anything. Yes, you can, believe me. You are not locked into JR. Tolkien so I Ford. decided <laughs> to take all of my friends to the bowling alley, because that is the funnest, coolest place where it doesn't matter what kind of person you are, everyone comes together over bowling. Um, but the inciting incident is that none of our feet will fit in the bowling shoes because we're hobbits. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so we try to split open the very slick bowling shoes down the front and nestle our big old feet in there, undoing some stitches on the side just to see if that will work. <laughs> But sadly, as we stripped the leather apart, <laughs> the shoes no longer stayed together and were basically useless pieces of leather on the floor. We're probably going to try using a different material to create uh, better shoes. <laughs> we try a 3D printer, but oh. unfortunately. Do we oh. get two tries oh, and no. two fails? Are we losing our order? Oh, sorry. Oh, 
we have a technical issue here. That's a no, fail. That's right. uh, and we fail because we've failed to read the instructions. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so we tried to stitch together two shoes to uh, wear for bowling. But then we found that there were not enough shoes for the whole group. <laughs> <laughs> Three hours later, we still haven't fixed the shoes and the bowling alley is closing. <gasps> Doom. But at the last moment, we decide we don't need the shoes. We just need the bowling ball to crush the ring. <laughs> And so we crushed the ring. <laughs> this is the resolution. <laughs> We're supposed to wrap up the loose ends, and I'm not sure what the loose ends are. I don't know. The ring's been crushed. It sounds like they can go home. <laughs> they go home. <laughs> and the moral of the story is? And the moral of the story is? Always go bowling. <laughs> Yay! Thank you, folks. You can keep your card or return it at the end. Please sit down. So um, I love, yes, you're welcome to sit down, and I will put this um, nowhere. Here, guard this for me with your life. Thank you. See if you can turn it off as well. OK, so the reason I love this improv, and I would happily do this over and over and over again, like we can go down and have drinks and do this, is because no matter how weird things get, the story's always interesting. Like there's a moment where you're like, how are they gonna solve the shoe problem? You know, and what about that ring? It's like Chekhov's gun, right? You know, when is the ring gonna go off? Thank you for closing the circle, super appreciate it. So um, this story structure is actually so powerful that it even works in improv, which I think is quite exciting. So the last piece of this is um, just a few more things. It's details. What you want to do is you want to transport people into the story. And we had that actually with our improv. We had these shoelaces, leather falling apart. We had a lot of things that really gave us a vivid picture of what was going on. So you want to transport people. You don't need a lot of them. I often think of it as a beautiful diamond in a plain ring. You need stakes. To be honest, there wasn't a lot at stake with our story because um, it was just a night of bowling that could have gotten ruined. But we did have the ring in the background, right? So that's pretty bad. If the ring destroys the world before the bowling is over, we might have a problem. But the higher the stakes, the more interesting the story. And then mysteries. Like, I think the story arc has an inherent mystery built into it, which is what's going to happen. But um, the more you can have these little uh, loose hooks, loose ends, people are intrigued by it, the more they're going to be interested in how the story ends. So um, I went to write an uh, article called How to Make a Conceptual Model. Could this be a more dry topic, right? <laughs> how to make a conceptual talk. But I thought to myself, you know, I want people to read it, especially my students. And so what I did is I wrote it as a mystery. I wrote about going to a conference and trying to figure out how to do it and not being able to draw and not being able to figure it out and talking to one person who gave me one part of the hint and the next person who gave me the next part of the hint. And it's turned out to be one of the most popular things I've ever written on Boxes and Arrows, which is wonderful. So um, the more I use the story, the more frequently I am able to have more and more successes with this approach. So um, if you're trying to explain something that's very dry and very boring, Think about how are you going to make it into a journey with struggle and high stakes and details and mysteries. So I think that's my last drawn card, but I'm going to do another one. So, you know, I think story will beat data, unfortunately. Um, so, you know the story of um, what happened with the Marin women who will not uh, inoculate their kids because they heard this powerful story about people who inoculated their kids and then their kids got autism. And even though there have been so much data that proves that's completely wrong, study after study after study that shows it was wrong. In fact, the original study that started off the story um, was disproved wildly. That data cannot fight with the story. However, if we can put story and data together, we can have winning. So perhaps the thing is to craft a story, we could do a dark story in which, you know, 
Measles is sweeping Marin County and suddenly the IQ goes up. Um, sorry, that was really mean. That was unfortunate. So um, I want to show you how you can use this for product now. So this is going to be one more live drawing. And this is a really nice trick. Um, what you want to do, and I do this when I teach um, my creative founder class, is I take an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper. And I fold it this way. This is the tricky part. Folding things in thirds is never very easy. But I have what is a fairly respectable six panel comic now, right? If you guys want to draw along, you are welcome to. Actually, it's too small. I'm going to do it with blank paper because that is way too small. But this is a really nice thing to do with your team. OK. So give me a character with a goal and a motivation. You can throw it out. We'll do it improv style. Um, think of somebody who might actually want a product, like a regular human, something vaguely regular. Student. A student? That's great. What's their goal? Finding housing. Finding housing? Oh, those are my students in San Francisco. And their motivation is perhaps, you know, not living on the streets with the scary people. Okay. So we have a student, and they're scary. And they have, you know, all their books. Um, my official story is that I draw poorly so that everybody feels good about drawing with me. I'm sticking with that story. And, um, but they're, they're dreaming of a little home of their own, which is probably actually going to be a um, bus, but we won't go into that. They have a goal. They have a motivation. OK. Now, for the second panel, we need an inciting incident. So uh, what would cause them to start looking for that home? <gasps> oh my god. So I don't use Airbnb because for some reason, Airbnb only gives me bed bug houses. I have no idea why. What do they even look like? like ew. So, and so our person is like, eek, right? OK, now I must find a home right now because things are getting ugly, right? OK, we got bed bugs. OK, so what's a struggle? What gets you in the way of your being able to find a new place to live? Lease isn't up. Lease isn't up. What else? Cost. Cost? We don't have enough money. Cost is good. What else do we struggle with? Um, I kind of like lease isn't up. That's one that um, I think I actually haven't seen a startup for. And I think I've seen a startup three years. Oh, no. That's not so great. This person has a hard life. You're stuck. You're trapped. OK, now they're doomed. Let's make it worse. Not only um, are they doomed with their three-year lease, right? But what else? What's making them even less likely? They could maybe live in these boots. What makes them even less likely to be able to find a home? What? Dog and a cat. Oh, God, yes. <laughs> no. OK, we have a cat. We have a dog. OK. But what about Fluffy? And, uh, and uh, they're really old, and nobody's ever going to adopt them. And meanwhile, out in San Francisco, as you guys may or may not know, prices are going crazy, right? We all know about San Francisco's rents. OK, so this person is doomed. They are never going to solve their problem. Ready? You guys get to invent a product. And then the product shows up. So what is the product that's going to save this person and finally help them live somewhere? What? Yeah. Rich Ant dies. Rich dies. We need a product. We're going to write the story to, to think about our product and how is our product living in this person's life. It, it could be a hitman, however. You know, <laughs> That's a product you can, you can pay money for. Zillow. Zillow? 
Zillow is the one that tells me I will never buy my house ever, <laughs> but okay. Um, a new version of Zillow, Zillow for poor people. <laughs> And it uh, lists uh, you can live in a bus, you can live in a tent. There's a nice tent available just outside CCA where I teach. Um, or you can live in this really attractive box that's been left outside the grocery store. Hooray! And it turns out that the box uh, takes cats. So, you know, we're in good shape here. Okay. And um, finally, this person's life is changed forever because, you know, now she lives with her cat and her dog. The dog passed away because he was too hard to draw. <laughs> what a nice box it is. And you know what? Because we're here, it'll be an Amazon box or possibly a <laughs> Nike box. Okay, it's a happy ending. So, you know, why, why would we do this as designers and product managers? Um, it's become a critical part of my, my design process when we develop new products because it creates massive empathy and interest and it places the product in a person's real life. Um, I have found these stories to be really powerful for both my clients because they get really interested in the story. It's very powerful for the designers because it contextualizes a product. I mean, when we draw products, we're way over here, you know, doing all these crazy uh, wireframes, right? You know, and we've got our browser, we've got drop down menus. You know, what have we forgotten? There's a person who desperately needs a box of her own. You know, and so by keeping it in the story and keeping the context of this person's struggle, we actually can create greater deals, uh, a great deal more empathy and feeling and remember where our product lives in people's lives. So I'm actually a big fan of the, uh, the story approach. So um, I want to go ahead and make sure we have time for Q&A because I find that you guys ask the best questions. So I will uh, put that out. Let's just go ahead and do a little Q&A right now on this. I will leave this up. I have a lot of stuff written on story on Elegant Hack, but I want to give a big fat 10 minutes for Q&A uh, so that we can like dig into these ideas that I just uh, threw out at you. Okay, let's start with questions. Otherwise, I'm going to make some, some up. Yes, ma'am. Um, you know, it's a, it's a good question. So she just asked, how do we have struggles when we're talking about a luxury item? Um, do you want to throw out a luxury item for me? Uh, a $5,000 painting. A $5,000 what? Painting. Painting, a $5,000 painting. Um, you know, often backstory is going to be your friend in this case. Um, so one of the things that I found out when I was, I was briefly working in LA and I was working for MySpace. And at MySpace, I found out that there were people who were living in terrifying neighborhoods in tiny studio apartments where they would sleep in their kitchen and they drove BMWs because it was critical. They could not move forward in their careers unless they had the appearance of wealth and the appearance of luxury. Now that's a BMW. Paintings sit in your living room, so they're harder to see. However, you could deal with that struggle of the person who loved art and loved music and reproductions, never did it. They'd buy these posters and, you know, a Monet poster might as well be a kitten hanging on because it just doesn't capture the brush strokes. And then they went to local uh, art galleries and they tried to find affordable paintings and, you know, they saved up their pennies and they bought this and they bought that. And then finally, you know, from years of brave struggle in the, the pits of Wall Street, they finally made enough money to be able to afford a beautiful piece that they could live with. And at the end of a hard day of destroying people's wealth, um, they could finally sit down on that sofa with their glass of champagne and, and experience exactly how Van Gogh had visualized that sunflower. 
Um, to be honest, I almost like this guy uh, because he, 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 he always loved art and he's tried so many ways to get close to art and finally this is his moment. And so how can we make that moment magical? Um, it works well for marketing. What's really interesting is I've actually started using this six panel before doing usability testing. And I know that sounds crazy, but if I take people through the story, they're no longer in this weird little room looking at an abstract website. They're suddenly like, oh, I know what this website's about. It's about me. I share the motivation of this customer. I know what they're trying to do. So it just recontextualizes all of our choices within emotion. I see squinny faces. More questions? Yes, ma'am? Uh, if you're you know, designing a product or website and trying to incorporate storytelling, it sounds that there's a certain like, goal and number of try and fail or issues that you should answer to if you can kind of keep it to the top three books that are most pertinent for your you know, target. So I really love this question. She just asked, is there a magic right quantity of try-fail cycles? And one of the things that I've been really surprised by is how robust this model is, even when it's collapsed down. So my daughter's taking acting classes. She's 10 years old. And she had to come up with a story that had 10 syllables, 7 syllables, 5 syllables, which is, I don't know what, some American haiku version. Um, anyway, but she, we, used, we used the story structure. And we said, OK, you know, it's a, it's a fairy who's lost in the woods. Uh, she meets a pack of angry, hungry wolves. She hides in a rose. And it became interesting. It's short, but it's intriguing. Um, the six panels is fairly small. Um, the longer version is much more exciting. However, sometimes you can't get people's attention. So if you're with a CEO, you need the haiku version. When you're working with a product team, I find the six panel, maybe nine panels is about right. You know, maybe two pages of comic, not much more. People start getting bored. They're like, who is this fictional person you're going on and on about? Um, in the case of stories, like actual novels and such, I like a little bit longer. Um, there's a lot of things you can do um, with presentations and story. So this, there's two things, there's two kinds of use, ways to use story in a presentation. Let's say you're trying to present your usability testing or a talk up here. And there's two things you can do. You can either use the arc, right? And then what we can do is we can put in facts and we can set them up. So if you watch a TED Talk, for example, uh, My Stroke of Insight, it's probably one of the most viewed ones ever. It's about a brain surgeon who has a stroke and she can watch her stroke. She tells the story of having a stroke, but in it, she like takes out a real brain and shows you the brain. And she explains how the right and left sides of the brain talk to each other and what the real difference is between right. So she's taken a story and she's decorated it with facts. The other thing you can do is you can flip it around the other way, which is, let's say you have three points to make. One, two, three. And you can do, do those little teeny stories. You can kind of decorate your facts with story. So let's say I needed to make three points about the usability problem, the issue with not understanding value, and uh, I can't think of one more problem, but something else you found in a, a user study. You could actually say, we saw eight people have this experience, and one really touched me. It was this mom, and she actually went on Amazon trying to find formula because her kid is losing weight every day because she can't find a gluten-free formula. And she tried to search, and she couldn't find it. And then she browsed kids, uh, the kids' area, and she couldn't find it. And you can leave the resolution open because people are going to want to close it. So you, know, you can decorate stories with facts, or you can decorate facts with stories. But they're both a way to keep interest up, keep people being passionate. Um, it, it can be a struggle because, unfortunately, real life doesn't fall into a nice wave. But in, even an incomplete curve, as long as there's a motivation that people relate to and a real struggle, people's antenna go up. Another question? Everybody has questions. I'm going to take that one and then this gentleman. Milady? The, you have to have motivation, and the motivation has to match the audience. So let's say you're pitching to a CEO. You know, you're going to want to find a motivation that he might share. He might not understand this student, but he might understand bed bugs if he travels a lot. Um, he might not understand the student, but he might understand um, 
you know, growing up poor. What's his story and can you match the motivation? Um, the goal will probably be product related. Otherwise, people wouldn't be using your product. If you don't have a goal for using your product, you have bigger problems in your story. Um, conflict is, usually internal conflict is not necessary for product stories. It's really good for novels, but it's less interesting. The conflict comes out of the struggle. So you don't need to be internally conflicted. Bad usability is sufficient try-fails for most products, I'm afraid. Okay, sir? Well, yeah, I was going to ask, um, in the workplace, you mentioned user stories, maybe like really rich scenarios um, for, this, uh, for the arc. Uh, any other examples um, where it could be really useful um, internally or with uh, users in particular? Um, the biggest thing I find is mostly in, around communication. Like any time that I have to persuade people, it's amazing for persuasion. So if I have to give a usability report, if I have to get people behind a new project, if I have to go to various uh, disciplines, um, I'll usually have in my back po pocket a mini version that I can tell, where perhaps there's just a user with a goal that has a motivation that matches my audience, which means I got to know what engineers care about and I need to know what product managers. A little bit of struggle why our site currently sucks or why somebody else's site sucks. Now, the struggle could be your competition. You could be like, my god, you know, they try ordering pizza and it doesn't work, and they try brown bagging and they're sick of tuna salad. And, you know, if we could just get them to our lunch delivery service, you know, finally they would be satisfied at lunch and they could get their work done on time and their boss wouldn't yell at them, you know. And of course we all relate to our boss yelling at them. So, you know, you can think if you can you can do it as a persuasion tool. So to be honest, um, unless you're making a product that is story based and that means you work for a game design company probably, I don't believe products are stories. Products can be heroes, products can rescue you, but products are almost never stories. Make sense? Any, do we have time for, we have time for one more question. Sir. What are the techniques that you use in presenting um, usability testing findings? Would it be to present some positive findings first to uh, get your stakeholders on board uh, before presenting, I guess, try fails or issues? Is that something that you can use in kind of integrating with this story arc or that's just something? I think um, successes are, are are wonderful, but you have to be really careful because they're just not very interesting. So if you talk about, th the thing you don't want to have happen is you do not want your stakeholders to tune out. So it depends on the stakeholder. If it's a product manager, they're dying to hear good news, so they'll be very excited. Um, if they're someone a little more senior, they're probably impatient, and it's like, why are you trying to fluff me? Like, at the general manager and le uh, level up, I find that they're like, stop congratulating yourself and get down to business. So you do always have to consider audience. I really should add that because we're all user-centered designers, right? And it all starts with audience. What's your audience's motivation? What do they care about? What's, how is the story going to reach them? But um, I think that for me, I would do, I would say everything was really successful and we thought we were okay, but we didn't realize how wrong we were. Like I seriously would use almost link bait level of mystery. Remember I talked about mysteries? <laughs> and then you can be cruel and you can say, and this other, you know, but search was really working as well. Okay, <laughs> you know, like if you can create just a little bit of tension, even in small doses, uh, fiction techniques really work well. So if you're going to start with positive, do some foreshadowing. Get people, keep, keep people awake, okay. Okay, well, I guess that's the last one. Thank you guys very much. Thanks for improving. Okay. Um, I need inciting incident because I know it's the hardest one. Who had inciting incident? Great. That's a super one. I want the moral because that's another hard one. And what do you guys think one last really hard one is? I'm kind of, unless you have strong feelings, I'm tempted to go with Bowling Alley. I thought that was kind of awesome, don't you think? Here you go, thank you. Enjoy the book, and thank you guys for making this an amazing talk. Thank you.